Good morning, everybody. No, this is not Ray Hewitt talking to you with a cold today. It's Dave Schmidt. I am your substitute teacher for today. And as our guest, Julie, just reminded me, we're not in the age where we're complaining about who our subs are. We're not saying I want I want Jeff Gargas or I want Chad Ostrowski or or I want Katie Miglin here. You get Dave Schmidt. You're going to be grateful that I'm here. You're going to celebrate me. You're going to probably send me some Starbucks gift cards just for saying thanks for showing up today, Dave. And I will welcome them and I will be grateful and I'll be appreciative. But today it is Wednesday, February 2nd. It is Groundhog's Day, which means I'm just going to be on here all day long doing this over and over and over again. I'm going to be just like Bill Murray. I'm going to be on here all day until I get it right. That's no, not true, but I will be on here a few times today. But welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Daily Drop-In. I'm so glad that you're here. If you are celebrating a snow day today, feel free to just put your earbuds in, cuddle up with that pillow and that blanket, and soothe yourself back to sleep to my voice. If you are getting up and getting ready to go change the world and change some destinies with your kids, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and joining in in the conversation. Got an amazing guest here today who's going to be wowing us with some research and some scholarship and I can't wait to geek out and she's also just going to wake us up with her amazing personality. We got a jam-packed daily drop-in. So Julie, are you ready if I throw it to the daily drop-in main music and get this show started? I'm ready Dave, bring it on. All right, let's do this and we will see everybody in 27 seconds. <laughs> All right, Julie, I got to point out, we've, we've got some people that are, that are glad that we're here and not Jeff Gargas. What they don't know is Jeff Gargas is sort of like that principal that shows up just to open the door and say, okay, somebody's here. And he went back down to, the, down to the office. Jeff Gargas did pop in a few minutes ago and just said, okay, Dave, Julie, you're here. We're good. And then he went back to bed or something. Went so. back to get a donut. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what principals do? <laughs> I, well, so... I don't know about donuts, but as a former principal, I used to to brag that I had the mini fridge and the coffee pot in my office. Like that was that was the thing about being a principal. Is you had the mini fridge and the coffee pot. You didn't have to walk down the hallway to the staff lounge to get the old stale coffee. You could make your own in your own Keurig. So maybe oh, that's what I, did, right now. I didn't have that, but lesson learned. Lesson if, learned. If we could go back in time and do it all over again, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, Julie, I, I'm super grateful that you are here. Um, I was telling you beforehand when Ray reached out and said that she wouldn't be able to be here today, she told us that you were going to be here. And I signed up right away and said, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Cause I can't wait to talk to you. I can't wait to, to share a little bit about you and the, the work that you do and introduce you to the people that have never met you before. So Julie, do you mind just introducing yourself to the world real quick? Sure. And I'm super excited that you are the sub today, Dave. We have Aww. a lot, we have a lot <laughs> in common. So we're going to have a good time. Hold on. Are you, are you bald? I'm not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. But, but I, we got other things in common. But you know what? This year we may all be balding. Like, <laughs> That's the truth. Very, it's very possible. <laughs> That's the that truth. We're all working our way that way. What a year. <laughs> right. Oh my goodness. But I'm I'm so happy to be here. I love daily drop-in. I was telling Dave that my daughter is a, a fairly new teacher, third year. She listens often on her way in. I don't know, Caitlin, if you're in this morning, but I'm sure she'll pick up the recording if she's not. I am a professor in school administration at Appalachian State University, so I'm in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. I have the best job in the whole world. I teach teachers, so my students are all grad students. They're teachers who are aspiring principals, um, so I spend quite a bit of my day out in schools with them, coaching, and then teaching classes. But the other part of my job is doing research, and I've been on a five-year project trying to understand the long-term impact we make on students' lives, mm. um, talking to people about what they remember about their teachers and what they carry and continue to use. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful path, gifted with lots of stories, and I can't wait to share some of those with you guys this morning. 
Awesome. We're, we're going to dive in to a lot of that because my geekiness goosebumps are starting to rise up right now, uh, knowing we're going to be talking about the research that you've done. And we're also going to be talking about the profound impact that we can have on, on kids' lives. So before we do that, let me say good morning to a few of our friends. We've got Katie Miglin, who is here. I know everybody was hoping that Katie was going to be here today. Sorry, Katie's probably um, ringing on a couple of kiddos right now. So, And we got Brad Hughes in the house. Brad will be joining everybody in a couple of days. So if, you, if you're wanting to see Brad, just wait till Friday. He's here every single Friday. So it, those of you that are joining us, feel free to drop in the comments. You can throw questions out there, too, if you want to ask some questions and get this conversation going in a way that is not Dave centric because I will take over and geek out. Like I said, so, so Julie, first of all, app state, the only thing I really know about app state, other than they, what you just told us is that, yes, don't, 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 don't <laughs> Julie. Yes. That they beat they Michigan. Did. And I have to tell you, my wow. parents went to Michigan state. So when they heard I was going to app state, they were fully supportive of that <laughs> <movie>. <laughs> i bet yeah michigan is the one that convinced app state they should be a d1 school because it's after true. they after app state came in and put that thumping on them they said hey let's let's go play with the big boys every weekend and yeah so they're they are a football powerhouse and they're growing into it they is- are playing at the rock carved <laughs> out of a mountain like how can you not dominate when your stadium is carved out of a mountain of rock that's awesome they're, they're an awesome team go mountaineers we, we love it here. Has that been home for you for a while? It has been home for us since July of 2020. So oh, we, wow. Really? We new. moved okay. here during a pandemic. I was a professor of ed leadership at Florida Southern College. I've lived most of my life in Central Florida, but the opportunity came for us to become faculty members here. My husband is a professor in accounting. So we both moved to App during that shut down. It was a crazy time to move, but what a blessing. We love it here. That's awesome. And now for, for people that might not know, you said you become a faculty member. So let's just, let's get in the weeds a little bit real quick, if you don't mind. In yeah. higher ed, um, when you become a faculty member, that means you're either granted tenure or you're on the tenure track and you're yeah. jumping through the hoops, doing the things, uh, teaching the classes, getting the scores, serving the university and doing a bunch of research as well. All of that. So I was a a teacher for 15 years, K-2 mostly, and then a principal in AP for about 10 years. And I left that role in 2015 to start the ed leadership program at my alma mater, Florida Southern College. Tenure track there at year five, turning into year six, came to App State with my husband to keep us and our family together, started the tenure process over. So Tenure for me will be a 12 year <laughs> journey, wow. but I love the research I do. And so it doesn't feel like pressure for me. It just feels like this is what I do. It's, it's so much a part of my work and my teaching and my research go together so well that it's pretty seamless. Oh, that's great. And, and for people that, that don't quite understand what that means to start it all over again, it means you're checking all the boxes. But the boxes aren't checked by you just completing tasks. The boxes are checked by the people you work with looking at you saying, we approve of the work that you're doing. And we feel like so it, there's also the emotional, relational capital that you're investing into a new place with new people when you start all over again. And it sounds like you're, you're on the right track because you're doing the right work in this, this meaningful way. So I think so. But, you know, Dave, we say this to teachers all the time. Like you have to tell your own story. Yeah. Like you have to do what you think is important and relevant and meaningful. And then you tell the story. And so for me, it's really helping people understand what I do, what I'm working on. And they're so supportive. Oh, that's great. That's great. So you're, you're diving into the research now. You've been you've been at App State for, we'll just say a year and a half, just to make it easier for us to, to calculate the math here. And you are studying the impact on students. Are you looking at student achievement? Are you looking at uh, the student affect? What do you, what do you look at? So, so here's how it started, Dave. It started so innocently. <laughs> so it, back in central Florida, when I was a new faculty member there, uh, I was advised pick a research focus. So at that time, my beloved first grade teacher retired. So many of the teachers who I remembered so clearly were retiring. And what I really wondered was, what did they say and do? that made me remember them so well. 
And I remember like things they said. I remember their classrooms. Certainly remember the way I felt in those classrooms. So I set off to try to figure that out. What do teachers say and do that makes this lasting impact on our lives? And I started, I'm a qualitative researcher, so I do interviews, observations. I started interviewing teachers about their impact. Not a good design because we don't know, you know, unless kids come back to see us, write us letters, somehow connect with us after they're gone. There's no way for us. We know what we hope it is, but there's no way for us to really have evidence of that impact. So I went to the IRB office, which is the office we go to to do human subject research, to work with Mick Lynch on research design. And he said, you really just need to talk to former students. They're not hard to find, like they're everywhere. So go where they congregate and figure out how to invite them to talk with you about teachers. Mm. So I brought props to Daily Drop-In. I know you guys who are listening can't see, <laughs> but here's my sign. So I got oh, wow. this sign that said, let's chat about a teacher you remember from the Office Depot. And when anywhere I couldn't get arrested, like <laughs> farmers markets, flea markets, university campuses, public So you're, one, you're one of those people that we see on Facebook standing yes. in the corner with the sign. Okay. Gotcha. That was me <laughs> with, this, with just this sign that said, let's chat about a teacher you remember. People lined up to oh, tell wow. me about the work that teachers did and the way teachers impacted their lives. And usually it came in the in the context of a story, like a very detailed story, this clear memory of a moment in a classroom that continues to impact their lives years, decades later. So I just started collecting these stories as data. And then after about, gosh, 50 stories, started to analyze that data, look for themes. Now we're over 400 stories. Those themes have held. But they're still really consistently present. So over and over again, people talked about the way they felt in those classrooms, and they talked about feeling safe and feeling seen and feeling stretched. Mm. No exceptions yet. Wow. Well, I, I'm still intrigued by this concept of you just standing there with a sign and people that don't know you walking up and just wanting to talk about this teacher, a teacher right. that most of them probably hadn't seen in years. But hadn't still really thought about except prompted by the question, like all these memories came back yeah. and they would tell like, I'm a perfect stranger to most of these people, this really personal story in the middle of the farmer's market, you know, and we would cry together in the street. <laughs> it is, it's so bizarre to think about, but for some reason it, it happened and it worked and it was such a lovely learning journey to be on, to be in those places, listening to those stories. I'm pretty introverted, you know, have some social anxiety. So it was a scary proposition for me, but I was more curious than afraid. Mm. And as I did it longer, it became even more curious about what people would tell me and still get stories. So cool. And I, I, I'm sure that doing this reconfirms and recommits you to the work that you're doing. That it reminds you, I, I don't want to be cheesy and say reminds you of your why, because I feel like we overplay that, but it, it reminds you of your purpose and the reason that you got into this, this field to begin with. And hopefully you're now able to take all that and share it with others and remind them of why they get into it. So typically when faculty and researchers do the research, they throw their, their research out into the ether for other scholars to be able to use. You took some of yours and have shaped it in a slightly different way and made it a little bit more accessible. What did you do with yours? Early on, when I started sharing the stories with my students, with friends who were teachers, one of my friends said, you really need to put these up on a blog. Teachers could use them. I had no idea how, what a, what a blog, how that worked, how to do it. Um, but got some help, figured it out, created a blog, which is the Chalk and Chances blog, started putting the stories up thought I might write some articles from it, but there was so much data and the analysis revealed so many things that it became a book, which was released at the end of 2021. So it's fairly newly out, safe scene stretched in the classroom. I think we're giving one away today. So someone may be a winner of that book, get to read all of those stories. Oh, that's so good. It's so good. Yeah. And so we are going to give a copy away. We're going to wait and give it away in about a half an hour. Uh, but here's what I want people to do that that want 
this, this copy of this incredible book. We're talking about the teachers that made a difference, the teachers that made you feel safe and seen, those, those teachers that made you feel like you were valuable. If you have one of those teachers that you can remember, not named yourself and not named Dave Schmidt, I mean, you can if you want to. If any of my former students are watching, feel free. But <laughs> I want you to identify, just put their name in the chat. Who, who was that teacher that, that made a difference, that made you feel seen, that made you feel valuable, that made you feel safe? Put their name in the chat, and then in about a half an hour, we're going to pick somebody, and one of, that person's going to win a copy of your book. Is that That's sounds great? Good? Awesome. And doesn't it make us happy just to say their name? Like for me, just to say Mrs. Russell, like just fills me with gratitude and joy and all, all the feels about oh. that teacher. I love that. I love that so much. So people think about who that teacher is. We're going to throw it to the commercial right now because we're talking about good things. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about the good news story of the oh, day. Yay. We're going to talk about this. And we were talking about this a little bit beforehand. It's it's an interesting one. So think about who that teacher is. Drop their name in the chat. We're going to throw it to the, the good news commercial. And we'll be right back to share more good news. All right. Well, we, we do have one person so far that is following the assignment and they're looking for a book. Lori Ann. Best. She was oh, awesome. Mrs. Best. Yeah. That's so good. What a perfect name. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, that's so good. Now, for me, before we go to the good news, I'll share mine. Mine. Her, her name was Mrs. E. Foster, uh, my third grade teacher. We had a Mrs. B. Foster, who was a fourth grade teacher, who was not the same as Mrs. Not e. your favorite. No, Mrs. E. Foster was absolutely incredible. She's the she is the, the teacher that made truly made me feel seen. I think that describes it more than mm. anything else. I was a Navy brat, moved around a lot, always slipped through the cracks. But she looked at me. She came to my house. She visited me. She she just she was incredible. She is the reason I do what I do today. So oh, Mrs. Um, Foster, thank you. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Incredible. Who Who is your person? Mrs. Russell is, you know, in the, in the first sentence in the book, I mean, she starts with her name. When I was little, I was very anxious. I'm dyslexic. So I had a hard time learning to read and walked into, thank goodness, Mrs. Russell's first grade classroom. And she mm. was so patient and positive. And I always think had she not been who she is, I may have forever seen myself differently as a learner. Like, wow. But because of her, I thought I am a reader, you know, even though it was hard for a while, I do belong in school. I, I am a learner. I can succeed. And in 2012, when I was a fairly new principal, I got moved to a school down the road and I went to meet the faculty and Mrs. Russell was teaching second grade. So I got to be Mrs. Russell's principal for a few wow. years and watch her like work that magic, make kids feel safe and seen and stretched all over again. And you still felt the same way, even with a different perspective and a different lens. Oh, you, I, oh, I think wow. I appreciated her more because as a kid, I knew how I felt, but I didn't really have the, the conception of what great teaching is or how much skill that takes. You know, it, yeah. it, it seems easy when you're a kid and you have a great teacher but going back and being her principal and being in her classroom, I think I really fully appreciated how very committed and talented she is. I, th I think that's so powerful because we tend to fall for the trap of believing great teachers are great anything. It's just this natural thing that just happens. They're just magical. But what we often don't get to see is we don't get to pull that veil away and see what's happening behind the curtain and all the levers that are being pulled and all of the intentional decisions that are being made. And the, the sheer effort and energy and thought that goes into it. So the fact that you were able to be that child, wide-eyed, seeing the magic happen, and then get behind the curtain and see how it was being done, is that's powerful. That's great. I had an intern tell me the other day that teaching's like ice skating. So when you watch it, it looks so simple. Like the people are twirling around. You think, I can do that. And then you strap on the ice skates and you realize there will be no twirling for a while. Right? <laughs> and I thought that was such a great metaphor for teaching. It looks so easy, especially when it's done really well until you try it. And then oh, you that's realize good. not, you know, not so easy. Now, earlier I was talking about Brad Hughes, who's one of the hosts on Friday. Uh, Brad Hughes, he's, he's from Canada and 
I was joking around with him last week and making fun of him a little bit to what we do and said, oh, I bet you were a, a curler back in school. He actually was on the curling team back in school, <laughs> which is crazy. But that's how I feel about curling. Oh, you're just walking around, you're sweeping stuff and throwing rocks. But I, until you get on the ice and you actually do it, you don't understand that there's actually skill involved. You can say that about bowling and pool and a lot of these things that look like they're even cornhole for that matter. All these things that look like they're super, super simplistic. And then you see the magic behind it. It's it's powerful. So another recommendation here, Mr. Todd Spence, Coach Spence, that Coach Spence. changed some lives. That's awesome. Oh, so good. I love that. All right, Julie, I said when we came back from the commercial, we were going to talk the good news story of the day. And instead, we talked a little bit more about some amazing <laughs> teachers. That's good. That's good news. That's that is, that really, is really good, good news. news. Coach Spence, good news. <laughs> yeah. um, but this segment, when when Ray does this segment, she pulls news stories from from the Internet and from newspapers and helps us celebrate the good in humanity, reminds us that there are good people out there, that there are good things happening, that when life is pulling us in a thousand directions, when we're exhausted, when we're, we're just feeling beat down, we can hold our hats on. There's good out there. It, and hopefully good's going to come our way soon. For some people, the good news is that it's snowing like crazy and you don't have school today. I was teaching a class last night um, to a bunch of students in Michigan, and they they're they're all teachers and administrators like like your students and it hadn't started snowing yet it's still 45 degrees and they were saying that their schools were already closing because of, of the anticipation of a snow day so they were celebrating that today we could celebrate that it's groundhog day where we get to find out if spring comes in six weeks or if winter ends in six weeks as though there's a difference there <laughs> we can also celebrate this amazing story that you and i were talking about before we went live let me just read the title for you, and I want to hear your reaction. The title of the story is doo -doo -doo -doo. Shoes Made from Coffee Grounds and Recycled Bottles Are Not Only Waterproof, But Super Comfy. We have Shoes Made from Coffee. Shoes Made from Coffee, and they're shoes waterproof. Shoes Made from... It's like two great things that are great together, shoes and coffee. It's, That's good news. That is some symbiosis if I ever heard heard of it. Now I'm wondering. So when I go I go for a run every single day, and normally when I'm taking my shoes off, I, I have to like hold them at arm's length. I'm wondering if this would change some of that. If I would be like tempted to be like my dog and start licking the bottom of my shoes after a long run. Mm -hmm. You know, you get that sweat water that's going into the coffee. Right. Like, that's gotta be good stuff, right? No. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm the image in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's disturbing dave <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry no, well, I mean, you really have me think and i'm thinking like how do they feel on your feet like would would my feet feel more awake faster ooh. like would i be a little more agile in my coffee shoes i don't know i, I think my shoes are probably already coffee shoes if i'm being honest i think coffee just kind of like permeates from my pores yeah um, but the, the idea of coffee shoes, like it's, it's an amazing story. It's very cool. It's sustainable. And they're using recycled bottles and coffee to, to make these shoes. But I often wonder when I see things like this, at what point did that light bulb spark in somebody's head and they're laying there and I said, I have an idea. Let's make some shoes from coffee. We could use leather. We could use plastic. We could use rubber. We could use all of these other um, polyester, all these synthetic materials, or we can use coffee. Let's do it. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and here like at app state sustainability is a big thing like it's definitely an initiative in our college of business sustainability is a focus so i could see kids here figuring that out for sure now something tells me they're probably not cheap they're they're probably they, they probably advertise how how great they are for the environment and um probably cost a pretty penny but Shoes pretty much just cost a pretty penny, no matter what kind of shoes you're getting these days. So true, and yeah. and what a conversation starter when right? you show up, when you show up in your coffee shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it, it needs to have some sort of branding all over it that says these yes. are made from coffee. Otherwise, I, I mean, I'm gonna start telling people that my shoes are made from coffee just to like, see the how, reaction. How would they know? Are they gonna test it? They don't know. Yeah, you just walk up and say, "Lick my shoes. Tell me what they taste like." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's awesome. I think that's definitely a good news story. And and also today, it, it is the it, it is that hidden holiday that if it wasn't for Bill Murray, most of us wouldn't even necessarily know exists. Um, Bill Murray put Groundhog Day on the map. 
some people want to say it's the day all about Punxs Punxsutawney Phil in Pennsylvania. But no, it is Bill Murray Day. It is the day where we put the day on repeat. We enjoy it over and over and over again. And for me, it's the day that we commit to just getting things right. It's also today. It's my wife's birthday Eve. So the birthday's Happy not today. Almost birthday. Yeah, uh, she she likes to celebrate for a week. So um, a week. Just... <laughs> her birth February is her birth month. Well, you know, oh, we were actually we were actually joking about that. That um, I'm going to start celebrating my birthday year, just so that um, every day can be about me. Um, but yeah, it's it's so <laughs> lots of good things happening. She gets one day, one day about her. one day. Well, and, here. and to be fair, sometimes <laughs> the Super Bowl falls on that one day. So her day gets oh, kind of taken, she gets taken over. And, yeah, but, you know. She should get another day to sub. But isn't that isn't that really what happens to, to moms in general? Like they're really kind of just is. like on the back burner in a lot of aspects of life. So I need to make a commitment that maybe my Groundhog Day commitment is keep working on that until I get it right. Maybe that's what I'll do. Celebrate. And isn't that what Bill Murray learned, right? Like yeah. If, if we stop focusing on our own needs and what what's best for us and really become other focused, then things work out. There you go. There you go. Okay. Now I feel like I've got some pressure. I probably need to go out and actually get some streamers or some or balloons or flowers or something. Yeah. Yeah. All right. When I click that buy now on Amazon and it says next day delivery, we're going to put that to the test today. And, and it's, <laughs> but it, it's snowing. So be careful. Be oh, careful. See, now you're just adding pressure on here. That's, that's not cool. That's not we cool. Li we live in the mountains. So that's <laughs> a little under the Amazon next day delivery is a little uh, unreliable. Okay. Okay. But can't, can't complain. Can't I, th I feel like sometimes that the next day delivery is sort of like that restaurant that says free food tomorrow and they have that sign out front. So when you show up, it's always tomorrow. It's always the next day. It'll be here the next oh, day. Just, just be patient. The next day is it, always you know, it may be next day delivery and then you get the little message. It's delayed. It's delayed. It was delivered That's somewhere. Delayed. They didn't say it was delivered to you. <laughs> it's somewhere the next day. You somewhere. just got to be patient. Yeah. It's out and about. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. So uh, let me just offer a quick reminder. Well, Brad is killing me in the comments here talking about those oh, the shoes Brad. whoever the inventor of those shoes was had grounds to pursue the great idea oh brad hughes that's, you and your funny, brad. <laughs> that's good stuff that's good stuff um a reminder to people we are giving away a copy of one of your books in about 15 minutes and all we're looking for is we are looking for people that can remind us of who that amazing teacher was in their life who's that person that inspired you made you feel safe made you feel secure, made you feel sane, uh, seen, not sane, well, sane too, and seen, sane. that person that stretched your thinking, that's be, helped you become the person you are today. When you look back on, if somebody were standing outside of a coffee shop or at a farmer's market with a sign that simply said, tell me about the teacher that made a difference in your life, you would know exactly who you were going to talk about. All you got to do to get the running, drop their name, maybe even a quick description of uh, why they were so powerful in the comments. And we're going to be choosing somebody real soon. So, all right. So, so, Julie, the next segment in the daily drop-in is something that uh, Ray calls the brainstorm bank. The brainstorm bank is my favorite part of this because it's just a straight Q&A. People can ask questions in the comments if they want to, or I can just take over and ask questions. So are you prepared in just a second for me to just start asking you some questions and getting you to I'm almost like rapid fire? We're just going to go and see what yes. you can come up with. All right. I don't I don't have coffee shoes on, but I'm ready. Okay. All right. So sit tight just one second. We're going to come back with the brainstorm bank. All right. Brainstorm bank. Rapid fire, but it's going to be based off of some stuff that you know. You okay. do research scholarship on educators and the difference that they make. So when you're looking at your research, what is the thing um, that most resonates with people? If you're a teacher today and you're out there saying, I want to make a difference, I want to change destinies, what is the thing they should be focusing on? You know, David, student-teacher relationships. And my research fits in with decades of research. There's Robert Pianta, there's Valesky and Stupik, like I could name all of them, that say that stronger student-teacher relationships lead to better academic social and emotional outcomes for kids. Like we know that's true. Um, I've, I've convinced some of my grad students to put strategies for strengthening relationships into like kids' behavior intervention plans. And we've seen behavior change because we focus on those relationships. We've seen attendance improve, certainly seen academics improve. 
we know that in a context of a strong relationship with a teacher, students are more likely to be engaged, to make effort in pursuit of their own learning. So I really think the heart of it is that relationship and taking the time to build individual relationships with students. Because I think when we talk to students, there's an expectation that teachers are collectively kind and interested. So stand in front of the class and and show concern for the class as a whole. But the ones who build those individual relationships with kids, who try to get to know them, build on their interests, notice the strength, those are the ones that tend to be remembered and that really can change the trajectory of a student's life. That is good. That's power. You know, I, I said before, there's a difference between recognizing every student and recognizing each student. And yes. what you just articulated is that, that that is the difference, that you have to be able to, to see each child for who they are. You don't want to be that, that teacher who at parent-teacher conferences, a parent comes in and says, my child is Johnny. And you say, oh, and what hour do I have, Johnny? And have to rifle through it. And the only thing you can tell about Johnny is their scores and their data and their, their grades know who each child is, know what makes them tick, know their passions, know their interests, know their skills, know their loves, their likes, their dislikes. I, that's, that's powerful. That's powerful. Are there, are, are there, when in your research, do you see that there are more elementary level teachers being recognized, more secondary teachers? Does it matter what subject or grade level they teach? It does not matter. And what's really surprising to me are the number of middle school teachers. Oh, yeah. Keep talking people now. Remember. Middle school people, I know, my right? people. Middle school. And I tried to figure out, like, what is that? Like, why are there so many middle school teachers in my data? And I think it is because it's that time when students are developing their own identity, trying to figure out who they are. But it's also a point where a lot of adults are having, they're having conflict with a lot of adults in their lives. You know, there there's some conflict with parents and and grandparents because they're trying to assert this independence. So when a teacher appreciates and loves them despite their squirreliness, you know, it's a really changing, important, validating thing mm -hmm. for a kid. But there's pretty even distribution in the stories. Um, I talked to a woman who is probably my age. So we turned 50 a couple years ago and we graduated about the same time. And she has this very clear memory of Mrs. Nash, her kindergarten teacher, sitting next to her on the rug, teaching her to tie her shoes. Oh, wow. like very detailed memory. And she said it made her feel so important and so worthy that Mrs. Nash took the time to sit with her and teach her something she really wanted to learn. She had a single mom, other siblings. Mom was too busy. She desperately wanted to be able to tie her shoes. And the fact that this teacher, took that time and sat with her and and did that was a memory that's lasted for decades. Wow. You know, that, that that's I love that. And it, it hit me right here and and here because I, I went back and I had a memory. So I've got four kids and I feel like they're constantly pulling at me, wanting wanting some of my time. And when I was a child, a statement that I used to hear over and over again was it's not my job to entertain you. And at the time it broke my heart because I was like, I just want some of your time. I just want some of your attention. I just want some of your love. I know what was meant behind it. Now, when I look back, it was, I'm exhausted. My job is to help you learn how to entertain yourself. My job is to teach you how to get along with siblings and friends and all of those sorts of things. But what I heard was, I don't have time for you. And so what that, that story just reminded me of is it's not necessarily your job to, to do the handstands and the cartwheels and to do all the tricks in front of the class. You don't have to do that, but it is your job to make sure that kids feel seen just to, to give them a little bit of your time, to sit next to them every once in a while, help them tie their shoes, because those are the things that make a difference. It's not necessarily about entertaining, it's just about being with, and that yeah. is so powerful, so and powerful. It, it communicates such a sense of value, and I've had so many people say to me, I had this teacher who made me feel worthy, mm. and because I felt worthy, I made better decisions for myself and others. So, um, and really middle school, high school kids who are on a trajectory that's not, not sending them towards a good outcome have had teachers who built that sense of worthiness and turned that around. Because wow. we know that, that self-worth is the foundation on which we make better decisions for ourselves. We make healthier choices. We, we put effort into the right things. So if we can do small things that help kids feel worthy, we can really make an impact on their 
on their lives. Oh, that's good. That's really good. So I, I'm wondering, one of my last questions for the Brainstorm Bank, trying to just get really practical here. So you work with emerging leaders. And part of that, you're, you're doing research, but you're also imparting within them wisdom and skills and, and attitudes to be successful. How do you teach somebody how to do these things? It's one thing to, to say, I'm going to teach you finance. I'm going to teach you public school law. I'm going to teach you legislation. How do you teach somebody compassion? How do you teach somebody how to build relationships? Are you familiar, um, Dave, with John Gottman's work at the Gottman Institute? I am. Yeah. I love him. So mostly what he talks about are rom romantic relationships, but really those strategies are applicable across any relationship. So there's specific strategies. And one of the most important is noticing a bid for a connection and then responding to that bid in a caring way. So um, people send out bids all the time. You know, my, my husband came home from a long day teaching yesterday and I could tell had a frustrating day. And so just saying, hey, do you want to talk about it? So I noticed his bid. I responded in a positive way. Kids are sending bids all the time. You know, mm -hmm. you talked about explicitly asking someone to play with you, um, to spend some time with you. Sometimes it's a sigh. Sometimes it's uh, tears, you know, whatever it mm -hmm. is. I, I was in a classroom with a, watching a friend teach not, not too many years ago. And she had this, she was, she's a great English teacher. Kids were coming in at the beginning of the period. She had this kid come in with like the hoodie over his head and slammed the backpack down and like sat down and crossed his arms. And I'm like, I can't wait to see what Amanda's going to do here. And I watched her go to her desk and scribble something on a sticky note and just like subtly pass it to the kid and keep walking. And he read it. And after a minute, like the hoodie came off, the shoulders relaxed, got out his book and started reading. And I was like, what? Mm. <laughs> so, all period. He was pretty engaged. And when they all left, I'm like, Amanda, what did you do? And she said, all I did was write, looks like you're having a tough day. I'm glad you're here. Let me know if I can help. One minute wow. to respond to that bid. And I think about, so that's turning toward in Gottman's work. Turning against is responding in kind of aggressive, demeaning way. Like, don't come in here with that attitude. You better take that. We've seen it. Yeah. Go out and try it again, which would have escalated him sure. for sure. He was already frustrated. Or turning away, which is just ignoring. He probably wouldn't have disturbed anybody else, but he wouldn't have been engaged. But in one minute of turning toward that bid, she really changed his day. It was a productive class. He was learning. Everybody else was learning. She could teach. So I think that bids for connection is such a tiny building block mm. for relationships with kids. And I would argue relationships with anybody. With anybody. But yeah, whether you're a teacher, a parent, a spouse, a loved one, and people make these these bids, as you, as you call them, as you describe them. And it's up to us to respond. We will respond. It's how you respond that matters, I guess. Are uh, you going to turn to? Or are you going to create a, a situation that escalates or make somebody feel unseen, unnoticed, and unvalued. It's all about making sure people feel valued. That's powerful. Okay. So my, my last brain break, brain break, I'm saying brain break. I'm sorry. Brainstorm bank question. See, I'm, I'm already getting my head towards this afternoon with, for, for brain break with Jeff, but the brainstorm bank question, you mentioned that your daughter may or may not be listening and watching today because she's on her way to school and work as well an educator in her own right, doing her own thing. I think you said year three. Year three. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put you in the hot seat. Is she a teacher today because of you? I think you know, she's fourth generation in our family. So my grandmother, my mother, me, and then sweet Kaylin. Um, you know, watching her grow up, I was really careful not to pressure her to follow this, this family tradition of teaching, but that kid was like born to teach. She, the principal who hired her a few years ago, describes her as the perfect mix of soft and strong, mm. which I love as a description for really good teachers. She's empathetic. She's caring. She's the most loving person, but she's tough and resilient. So she was the kid who would like stick up for other kids or was not afraid to do the right thing. Um, and sometimes that toughness and resilience was challenging as a mom, <laughs> but, but I always knew it would serve her well. 
so I think she she gravitated toward you know working in the preschool and and just anything that required nurturing she had amazing teachers so I think they probably inspired her quite a bit Linda Reed her third grade teacher and now Kay's teaching third grade in the same district so I think Linda had a lot to do with the kind of teacher she is she had so many people pour into her and she do, she started in the 2019-2020 school year. So pandemic happened at the end of her first year. She's never had a non-pandemic year, but she's navigated it and she's done really well. And sometimes I ask her, she's at an urban school in Tampa with a lot of needs. I'm like, hey, don't you have behavior issues or like, don't you struggle? She said, I really don't, mom. I love the kids and they love me. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. I love that. Um, you're, you're just filling me with inspiration and good vibes today. I absolutely love it. Tell you what, in just a second, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you on the, the spot. We're going to do two things and then we'll give away your book. In a second, I want you to offer recommendations for people. Recommendations to read, to explore, to learn what you're listening to. Just some recommendations for people. And then we'll, we're going to choose the winner of your book. So people that want to explore that, that want to uh, dive into it and figure out what it is that they can do to connect with others. So are you ready in just a second? I'm going to offer you the chance to offer some recommendations to people on what they should okay. be exploring and what they should be learning. Okay. So right. think about it. We're going to come back in just a second. All right. So I'll go first, if that's okay. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on today when I'm hanging out with Jeff and having a little cocktail. But right now I'm reading Brene Brown's Atlas of, it's Atlas of the Heart. I, I love Brene Brown's work. It just, it resonates with me in a very real way. But her work right now, it's, it's all about naming and identifying all of your emotions, not just recognizing things as happy or sad, but looking at the full spectrum, being able to identify them so that you can lean into them and other people can support you and you can be better articulate your needs. It's, it's, it's a great book. It's an easy read. Um, it's not really deep. She's a researcher from, from Houston, um, but it's, it's very practical. Um, aside from that, what recommendation do you have for people right now looking to, to grow, improve, get better? And I love, I love Brene Brown too. She makes us qualitative researchers look. <laughs> <laughs> she puts you on the map and gives you some credibility. Yeah. People understand us a little better. <laughs> Thanks to Brene. Um, like I said, Gottman Institute is wonderful for resources about relationships. So that's one I am reading. A um, couple of things. Big Potential, Sean Aker's book. Oh, yeah. Um, loving that one. Transforming the Pursuit of Success. Um, so looking at how we're defining success, uh, what, what kinds of evidence of success are we looking for? And, and I love thinking about starting the day with an intention and using that to measure success. So I have a friend who's a math teacher. His intention almost every day is to help kids be more confident in math. And if he's done that, the day was a success. It doesn't matter what scores they got on the test or what else happens. If he fulfilled that intention, that's a successful day. Oh, it's, that's good. I, I love it. I love it. Wait, now in your journey, um, you, it sounds to me like you're you're reading big picture type books, which is where I'm at too right now. I like to to look at the world around me and try to understand the world and what makes other people tick. At the same time, it causes me to reflect on my own personal journey. Um, I, I set New Year's resolutions for myself and goals and things that I'm trying to achieve and boxes I want to try to check. Some of them are fitness goals and health related, but some of them are just, I want to be a better person. I want to be a better listener. I want to be more empathetic. Um, I want to, to be more honest and transparent. I want to be able to provide feedback that's specific and, and meaningful to people without having to, to be solicited and without coming across as judgmental. So these are all things that I've got notes on and things that I'm working to improve. Are you a New Year's resolution person? I am. So the same as you. Like it's never okay. It's never a measurable outcome for me. You know, I'm the qualitative yeah. researcher. And so it's it was always big picture. Yes. It's February 2nd. Do you still have the same resolutions? I do. I, and I so do. how are you able to stick to them? What is your secret? I have, well, I've been thinking about a tattoo. Okay. <laughs> really have, but there's a story there. So my resolution, I, I tend to go really fast and do a lot of things at once. 
and I felt like, speaking of bids for connection, I wasn't present and focused enough. So my resolution has just been to pause. Like mm. when something happened, just pause for a minute, take a breath, and think about, like ask some, some questions before I assume. And I think great teachers do that anytime something goes down in a classroom, instead of reacting, they just pause and take a breath and kind of think about what are, what are some other narratives that are possible here? So for me, it's been pause. And I really am thinking about a pause, a pause That's time good. tattoo. But, but I put visual reminders up just to circle with the two lines, right? Visual yeah. reminders of that up everywhere just to say, okay, like stop just running, running, running. Something's happened. Someone needs you. You're feeling a little eh, like pause and let's, let's ponder this a bit and figure out what's going on. That that's powerful because yeah, I, I'm one of those people I'm on to the next thing I'm looking mm-hmm. for. Okay. I've, I've done this. Where am I going? And even the thing I'm doing right now, oftentimes gets sacrificed so I can plan for the next thing that's coming up. Yes. So that need to just be still in the moment, give yourself some intentional pause time is that's a great reminder, really good reminder. So how about we take that advice and we, we pause for a second and we simply look at the, the names of those people that made a difference to all of us. Those of you that are going around right now, you're running frantic, you're yelling at kids, you're brushing your teeth, you just spilled coffee on your coffee shoes, you are having to scrape ice off of your car, you're wondering if you're going to be there on time, you've got all of these things happening right now. Just take a pause. Take a time to reflect and remember why you do what you do, that person that poured into you, that helped you feel seen, that person that helped you feel valued. Remember that some of the kids that you're going to be running into today probably had mornings just like yours where they were running around and frantic. Maybe they were the recipient of that parent screaming and yelling at them to hurry up and get ready. Now they're showing up into your classroom and they need somebody that regardless of their morning is going to help them feel valued and help them see, feel seen. Remind them that it's okay to be a kid. It was going to remind them that they are loved and they're cared for, they're nurtured and they're safe. So just take that pause for a minute and reflect on that person that you needed when you were younger and how you can be that person for somebody else. So Julie, while people are taking that pause, I need you to do me a favor and pick a number between Mm. one and five. Pick a number between one and five. I'm going to go with four, Dave. You are going to go with four. Four is our friend, Lori Ann. Lori Ann. Mrs. Tanya Best. So Lori Ann, do me a favor. Shoot me an email, dave at teachbetter.com. And Lorianne, I'm going to hook you up with all the things that you need to get this amazing book. Well, uh, look, Julie, can you tell Lorianne what the name of the book is one more time? That's going to be yep. showing up. I'm and- out of here because I brought props. There so you go. Drop in. Here it is. Safe, seen, and stretched in the classroom. The remarkable ways teachers shape students' lives. Awesome. Awesome. So Lorianne, you're going to get a copy of that book sent your way simply because you remembered an amazing teacher that, that made an impact on you. Just like you're making a powerful impact on so many others. Um, I know that right now you're doing a lot of exploration with assessment and and grading. And I I saw your comment there, Lori, and send me a message. I'll hook you up with some questions and ways to go get them. Um, But you're doing a lot of things to personally grow yourself and to make yourself better. You're stretching yourself. And I want to let you know that I see you as well. And it's safe to continue to explore and learn and grow. And um, just like your, your teacher did for you. So Julie, you're, you're incredible. You got a lot going on in your world and your life right now. And here on the, the team, we've got a lot going on in our world as well. I don't know if you heard this, but got a conference coming up in October. I did hear that. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of a, it, it's a lot right now. I sent out a, a tweet yesterday and just asked people to retweet it and share it if, if they're going. And I am so excited to see all the people that were commenting on it, that they're planning on being there. So this is your, your reminder, people, if you haven't registered yet. It's time. It is time to register so you can show up and, and hang out in October. And show up show up in your coffee shoes. There you Do go. It. Do if it. You come in wearing some co- coffee shoes. I might just lick the bottom of them. Might. We'll see. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Maybe. But yeah, show up. Come hang out. Come come learn and grow with us. Connect with us. Network with us. going to be a lot of amazing people there. We announced earlier on Monday who... Uh, two of the featured speakers are going to be 
so you can come and, and learn and grow. And I'm not going to mention them to you right now because I want you to go back and listen to Monday's episode if you haven't yet. Listen to it on podcast or go back and find it on Facebook or Twitter, Twitch, whatever. Um, can't wait to see people there. If you're interested in um, speaking at the conference, proposals uh, go live in less than a month. March 1st, you can submit your proposal. So start working on that, polishing it off and uh, figuring out what value you want to provide to all of us. Everybody has something to say. Everybody has a message. Everybody has something that you can impart into all of us. So work on that proposal, work on that draft, and be prepared to send it on March 1st. Later today, I'm hanging out with Jeff Gargas. We do have our Wednesday brain break taking place, and Lord knows some of you need it today. So if you're just looking for some shenanigans, just looking for somebody to keep your company while you make dinner or give you an excuse to start that cocktail early, you can come hang out with us uh, 5 Eastern for real time, for central time, and uh, we'll hang out and have a good time. Julie, any final words that you want to impart to the world for the, the educators out there trying to make a difference? Any reminders just to, to get their day started in the best possible way so they can go out there and make a difference for kids? I just need to tell you that I have evidence that the work you do matters, that you matter, that I could stand at a farmer's market and students you taught years or decades ago would come and tell me stories about you. They were, they're probably moments you don't even remember, but they've had this amazing lasting impact on a kid's life. So thank mm -hmm. you for doing what you do. That's awesome. And Julie, thank you for making an impact on my life and the life of everybody else that's watching and listening today. You're truly incredible. People, if you are not already connected with her, she's got her, her, social media handle right there on the screen. Connect with her. You will be inspired. You'll be empowered. You will continue to grow and you'll make a new friend. So have an amazing day, everybody. Go make an impact. Go chase better and do all the things that you love. We'll see you soon.